Hi, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we're going to talk about religious OCD. I'm going to have a conversation with Bethany. Bethany has been diagnosed with several forms of OCD, and uh, that bleed, bled over into her faith life and her faith journey. And there's something called religious OCD that can cause people to be extremely scrupulous in matters of of Christian doctrine and worry and anxiety and that sort of thing. Now, the reason I wanted to bring this to you is because on this channel, we cover stuff with regard to cognitive science and personality disorders. And I thought it might be encouraging or useful or thought provoking uh, to consider the journey of a Christian who has been diagnosed with OCD and how it affects other areas of life and how it affects uh, the faith areas of life. Now, I will say that a lot of people joke about OCD, like anybody who's particular about anything, they get accused of having OCD, but, but OCD is a very serious condition that is disruptive to many people's lives. So I'd ask everybody in the comment section to be sensitive to that, okay, and don't treat this frivolously. Now, there's a couple things that didn't make it to the video, and I want to share those with you right now, okay? The first one is that she wanted me to make sure that one of the resources, now we cover some other resources, but one of the resources she also wanted to mention and didn't get to mention was uh, Mark De Jesus. Uh, we're going to mention another book and we're going to mention another psychiatrist that you can look up as well in, in the conversation part of the video. But Mark De Jesus, here's a screenshot of his website and a screenshot of his of his YouTube channel. Okay, so go check those out if you want to hear more information about this. Now, the next thing I want to show you is she has. Uh, we didn't get to share this in the video, but she has an eight-part. I misspelled her name, Bethan. Bethany. She has an eight-part uh, little formula here on what she does when she's encountering an OCD related panic attack. Okay. And uh, before this video, I hope she doesn't mind me sharing this, but she has panic attacks fairly regularly and, um, um, was, was concerned that maybe the video process might get disrupted because one of those might come on when she starts to feel that come on. Here is the eight step process that she goes through. Okay. I haven't vetted this or anything, but if you want to get a copy of this, I would invite you right now pause the video right now and screenshot this uh, so that you can have this and look this up later. So just, uh, I'm going to leave this here just for a second. Pause the video here, screenshot this uh, so you can look it up later. These are Bethany's eight steps for what she does to cope with a panic attack. So if you want that information, uh, please do go screenshot that. And then also some of us on this channel, we're also following Fowler stages of faith. And just as uh, informationally for those following along and you're, you, maybe you've read the book or you're reading the book, that kind of thing. I've thought about giving stage disclaimers for the content that comes on each of our videos. This is going to, this is going to hover around stage three. Okay. Just so everybody knows that now without, huh? As James White would say, without further ado, let's get into the conversation. All right, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we're going to have a conversation with Bethany. And Bethany and I have been talking, what, how long we've we been talking about over, last time we chatted in detail was what, like a year ago? Yeah, it was about a year ago, um, but like three years off and on. Yeah, yeah. So we've had, we had a really interesting phone conversation at one point. And we're talking about the concept of OCD and religious OCD. And as, as the conversation developed, I think that some of what you described, Bethany, I think it in some ways afflicts more people than people might think. And the concept, the concept of OCD, in my experience, usually comes up as a joke. Like when somebody wants something a particular way, um, oh, you got OCD, but yeah. from, from the conversations that we've had, what I've learned from you that OCD is no joking matter. Um, mm. it's, ex it could be extremely disruptive to somebody's life and what, you know, because of some of the stuff that we look at on this channel, it's extremely, I think it's extremely relevant to 
people's desire to want to propositionally control their Christianity with words. So there's like a controlling aspect to it. So we'll look at that. So what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll give some basic definitions of OCD from that, that anybody can see on the web. And then I'm going to start asking you questions and have you tell some of your stories. So I'm going to share my screen here. If I go okay. to, uh, so a definition of OCD, it's it's referred to as a common, chronic, and long-lasting disorder in which a person has uncontrollable recurring thoughts, obsessions, and behaviors and compulsions that he or she feels the urge to repeat over and over. Um, it is, OCD falls within anxiety disorders, and some of the experts that you po that you recommended to me, they would say, well, Obsessive compulsive disorder used to be called severe scrupulosity, like people who are extremely scrupulous. And um, the the person you pointed out to me, oh, I got rid of a, I got rid of an entire. Oh, there it is, right there. He's the guy that wrote this book. Ian Osborne was the one who said the severe scrupulosity, and he also said that it's connected to fear. So there's some kind of extreme fear, or I guess anxiety would come in there. And then there's some kind of behavior that's associated with a fear. And another guy that you pointed out, he has some YouTube videos and a website, John Glanville. He, he says that obsessive compulsive disorder really should be called obsessive compulsive order because the person becomes so orderly. But um, I, I think that that it's like too much order to where it becomes a prison. It becomes a new kind of chaos. Right. And it be, so it is disorderly to a person's life, even though there is extreme order. And the, so he calls it carefully orchestrated dilemmas, yeah. which, <laughs> which I think is very interesting. He also covers four major components, like intrusive thoughts, compulsions, controlling behavior, and then covering it all up. And then you shared with me some brain scans to where there are actually some physiological differences in a normal brain versus an obsessive compulsive brain. Um, and there, here's another shot here where there's a healthy brain next to an OCD brain. Um, now, to you... I guess you've been diagnosed with multiple forms of OCD. And I was wondering if you could tell us from your experience, what is it? And I'm, I'm particularly curious about religious OCD and right. how that manifests itself and, and, and the other ones as well. So yeah, OCD sure. versus religious OCD and, and whatever other diagnoses you want to talk about that you think are relevant to that. Yeah. So basically OCD like you said, is an anxiety disorder. And, uh, you know, it, it gets, you get intrusive thoughts and then you have to perform compulsions to kind of alleviate those fears. Mm -hmm. And so the, that's the basic definition of it, but then you just get stuck in a pattern. And then, uh, you know, the types of OCD are like harm, Contamination, OCD, sexual, religious, health, just right, relationship. Just and, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's where the feeling has got to be like just right. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you're, if you have contamination, OCD, like you have to wash your hands until they feel just right. Like you can't stop you have to you have to keep going until yeah like until yeah, i have this i have this thing where i'm i'm obsessed and i have been since i was a kid and it's probably not ocd but i'm obsessed with like finding the exact middle of something on my body like what's the exact middle of the top of my head and nothing yeah. feels exactly like the middle or what's the right. exact middle of the tip of my elbow and nothing feels exactly right and it drives me crazy yeah yeah, and then there's pure <laughs> O, which is um, what was that? Pure O. So that is just the obsessive thought. Compulsions don't pure come with o. that form. Okay. Yeah, compulsions don't come with that form of OCD. No compulsions. So, right. So they just have the repetitive thoughts, and 
uh, out of all of these, I would say that, you know, I struggle with, well, to, you know, some to a lesser degree, some to a greater degree. I would say, you know, the more serious ones I struggle with would be obviously religious OCD and then health. That's a big one. And contamination. And mm -hmm. then, you know, the other things is just um, a little bit of sexual, a little bit of harm. And then, of course, well, I guess the just right should be at the top of the list, too. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's mostly what I struggle with. So, so, so I'm, I'm curious about all these. Uh, do you okay. have versions? Do you have versions of uh, summaries of all these that are, I guess, appropriate for mixed audiences? <laughs> Well, I can I can give you examples. So, yeah. uh, like something, religious OCD is or scrupulosity, you know, that comes from scruples. Yeah, where you have you know some sort of you know fear about, um, you know, maybe blaspheming the Holy Spirit or yeah, losing yeah. your salvation or you're not really saved or just things like like that. assurance assurance yeah. people have assurance right. problems so like later right. on I'll, I'll probably talk about my brother a little bit he he had assurance yeah. problems all his life yeah and i mean i still struggle with it it's very very hard to get over but i right. mean you can pretty much uh, i'll give an illustration later on that talks about that though um it, it's got to do with uh john bunyan's grace abounding to the chief of sin yeah that's a good uh, book to check out dr ian was saying um that john bunyan and possibly martin luther and maybe some other people well-known people had uh ocd yes yeah yeah it's a big deal and then the um i don't know how you pronounce her name Ter Therese, teresa Ter teresa um, she, he's talking about a Catholic saint, like I'll just call her St. Therese. Okay. Uh, and so he, he talks about her in his book and goes into more detail. I think she's the last one. She's the most recent one, um, you know, in terms of centuries that lived, I, I forget, uh, somewhere around like the 18 or 1900s. Yeah. Um, but she, well, I guess all of them have really similar experiences to me, but definitely her because she had a very, you know, odd thing happen to her. But I guess I can talk about that in a bit when we get on to the religious OCD. So yeah. contamination is like you feel like something's dirty all the time, like your hands, you're afraid of germs. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to wash your hands. That's one of the compulsions or and some people get so bad they can't even leave the house anymore because they're just like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get so sick. And a lot of these play off of each other. They tie into one another too. Right. So the contamination will tie into the health. So, you know, people become hypochondriac. That's right, right. The things that I said is really high up on my list. I deal with a lot. And, you know, I mean, anything that happens to me, I'm just, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. Like immediately that's, that's the thought. And so, um, I guess that covers the health is just so, basically well, you, you become have, a hypochondriac. If you have hypochondriac, by, by the way, that was like, that was one of my favorite spelling words when I was in the fifth grade. Oh yeah. <laughs> if you, if you are a hypochondriac and you know that it's because you have OCD, how much of your top down knowledge of your mind, knowing that you have OCD, how, how do you use that to combat this the anxiety or sensation or fear that there's something wrong with you can you can well, you self-soothe if, yeah. if you will yeah you can to a certain degree i mean it takes a lot of work and a lot of practice but you have to keep telling yourself it's just an intrusive thought like i'm not right. dying and the thing about ocd though is with it being an anxiety disorder it's crazy because things will actually jump around because so say your throat's hurting and you're like oh my goodness i have throat cancer so yeah, and i'm yeah. gonna die and then you make yourself get over that okay well then tomorrow your left arm starts hurting oh my gosh i'm having a stroke or a heart attack <laughs> and so it's it just jumps it jumps around it's really bad like you know if, if 
if you're just short of breath, you'll say, oh no, I'm dying. Like You've I'm got asthma an attack, and I'm dying. arrhythmia. Yeah. 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 That's one of the things that really, really is hard for me is my breathing. Like whenever anything happens to my breathing, I just, I just have to go sit in a room by myself and, you know, just tell myself like, I'm not dying. But that's the thing is you always forget about that too. Like you, you, for some reason, you just get so wound up and you get so anxious that you just forget that it's actually an intrusive thought. And mm. so I actually have a list. We can go through it of things um, well, after I had my daughter. Yeah, I want to go through I, the list, but I'm, yeah. I'm curious, like when it comes to hypochondria, I've also known, and I, I hate to keep interrupting you, what you're saying is yeah, super interesting. Fine. When you, um, I, I'm no clinician, but- mm -hmm what's do you what's the like what what you're describing sounds like you actually have real anxiety over your health whereas i've known hypochondriacs in my life where i suspect that they don't have real anxiety over their health but that they're using like they're malingering they're mm -hmm. pretty much making a mountain out of a molehill for the sake of getting attention from people or for the sake of like controlling other people's behavior. Uh, like mm -hmm. I, I, I need to control everyone else's perfume because I yeah. can't breathe that, <laughs> or you need to make certain kinds of ingredients because that it's like, they just use it to, and, and you kind of know they're doing this, but nobody calls them on it. It's right. like, a, I don't know if that's like a different kind of hypochondria or a different kind of OC. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that it, that doesn't sound legitimate to me. Like a real hypochondriac is like staying in the house. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. Because you know I can't. Like there was a time in my life when, you know, um, when I I had a really intensive knee surgery, and mm -hmm. when I had to take all kinds of medication for it, I got. I was like, I am going to die because I'm taking so much medication. Wow. And yeah, it was it was like I think it's called a tibial tuber tuberal or tubercle osteotomy where they like um it, my kneecap kept popping out of place. And so they have to like open up your shin bone and then take a tendon, wrap it around your kneecap and then put it under the shin bone and screw it back in place. And so it's a, it's, it's a really big deal. And so, yeah, I was on, the doctors told me right away, you're going to be on all kinds of pills. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I'm taking so many. And the doctors were like, no, you're not. You're not taking that much. Like, yeah, you are taking a lot, but you're not going to die. We're watching you. You're okay. And I had panic attacks every time, even when I thought, the second I thought about taking a pill, I would just immediately shut um, down. Immediate panic and, attack. Yeah. All day, all day. I would just like, because, you know, uh, pain pills, like, slow down your breathing, and then that's how people die is yeah. because, you know, it slows everything down. And so I'm uh, like, I'm not getting enough air. Like, I can't breathe. Like, something's going on. And so that was, like, you know, a big thing. I mean, I definitely know those kinds of people, too, who uh, try and control everything. And I there's actually a church that I thought of when you – when you said that, that I've only watched online, but at the beginning, they're like, they put a message on there. Don't wear any perfumes here. Some people right, are sensitive right. to it and stuff like that. Yeah. And people so just like, they just like to up. be the exception right. that, that forces everybody else to behave differently. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, honestly, I don't know like what, I mean, I guess hypochondria would be like some sort of anxiety disorder, true hypochondria. But I don't know that it's necessary for you to have OCD to be a hypochondriac. Right. The, yeah. But, on the bin, yeah. Which one? Yeah. Which one's the chicken? Which one's the egg? Right. And and the OCD and like um, the article I sent you the other day, it talks about how um, it affects your basal ganglia. And that yeah. is actually the part of the brain that is affected when people have Parkinson's. So it's wow. movement. Yeah, it's movement. And they, they speculate and theorize that that's why you have the compulsions. That's why you have to do something. 
because, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the region of the brain it affects. And also like you're basically the studies, well, you know, brain scans have shown that it's, it's just hyperactive in certain areas, like your brain's on a loop and that's why the, the salts are so repetitive so, and they keep coming. Yeah. My, my understanding of the vagus nerve is that it's also responsible for fly, flight or fight or yeah. openness. And so it makes me wonder if, uh, if, if even something simple as I'm not sure if I washed my hands correctly would cause you to go into a, a fight or flight type of anxiety to where you must do something. Yeah. And a lot of it is like, um, to be honest, uh, my, my husband and I have struggled with this too, as well as, you know, probably almost every OCD sufferer out there can relate is you have, you, you settle into routines. And mm -hmm. so when your routine gets interrupted, you shut down. If you are a, someone with a strong personality like me, you can completely throw a tantrum and, wow. and just get, get, get angry, start a fight. Why'd you interrupt me? You know, I have to do this a certain amount of times. Stop, leave me alone, get away from me, whatever, you know? And, and that happened a lot when I was first married and my husband was like, whoa, like he comes from a family that's no, no <laughs> drama whatsoever. And so he's like, she's crazy. Like, <laughs> who <did> I just <laughs> marry? <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's toned down quite a bit. But, um, yeah. Yeah, it, I imagine that that really plays into relationships a whole lot. Yeah. And it's, and it's like you can't stop, though. Like, even if you know you look stupid washing your hands for 15 minutes in the bathroom, in the ladies' bathroom, in a public restroom, mm -hmm. you just cannot stop. And so you'll just, like, pretend, like, oh, I'll just pretend that there's, like, some sort of ink on my hand. And that's why, like, I'm really so having to So you're trying to, to cover it, it up. You're trying yeah. to look normal. Right. Yeah. And so, you're Trying yeah. to look like you have a legitimate concern when you... Yeah you know in your mind that you don't but you must do this anyway right yeah yeah <laughs> you know it's crazy and my mom probably about the 20th time she told me this she just realized that I was just going to tune her out but she would just be like Bethany just tell yourself you're not going to do it anymore just just tell yourself you're not going to do it anymore I'm like Oh yeah, because I never thought about doing that before, Mama. So, Are you so kidding? it's interesting that you bring this up because I was bringing up, you know, I was having a conversation with my wife a few minutes ago about um, what I suspect to be types of OCD and people that I know, and uh, she was like, "Well, don't they know this? Don't they know this?" And I'm, and uh, you know, on the video that we watched, the material that we look at about OCD is that um, it's it, logical thoughts are not the solution. Yeah. The, the problem, the problem is overthinking to begin with. So it's, it's mm -hmm. not that people lack the knowledge. It's not that people don't know that that is not an issue or that doesn't need to be done. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, they know it's stupid. You they're know not operating on the same logical line of thinking that other people would. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it's not the absence of an injection of logic is why they're doing that. It's something else. <laughs> Yeah, you have to find that. Yeah, exactly. And then um, one thing that he said in the interview, um, Ian Osborne or Dr. Osborne, is he 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 talks about this in the book, and um, he said it's an issue of trust. So what they found, and he goes over this in the book, is that um, they would do experiments on people with OCD. So some people with OCD have an irrational fear of setting the house on fire. Mm. And they will go back and they will check their stove over and over for hours to make sure they've turned it off because mm. they just, as soon as you walk away like that, it's, you're just like, Oh no, but, but I might've been spacing out the last time I checked. So I need to go check again. Like what if right. something, yeah. what if I was so scared and I blacked out and I actually turned the stove on this time. And so you just keep going back. It's, it's so it's irrational. So I think everybody and, has this kind of fear to a very small mm -hmm. degree. Like you might leave the house and you're like, Oh, I, I can't remember if I locked the side door or right. I can't remember if I turned the stove off after I took the pasta off the stove. 
but so we most of us would go back and check once and then we're good right but but these people cannot do that no no they can't and um you know it, it, it you just get stuck like i've i've heard of people uh driving around in cars they have harm ocd so they have a fear like that they're going to hurt somebody or that they are going to get hurt so they ride over a bump in the road and they'll circle around for hours thinking they hit somebody and they'll be checking and checking and checking and i'm thinking oh my gosh don't didn't the police so they're scared they're going to accidentally hurt somebody yeah they're scared they actually did hurt somebody when they hit that bump. oh okay they're, so they're they scared that they around. actually hurt. okay yeah so they circle around looking for the dead body or somebody you know just to, to show up even so it's not like somebody with area. uh homicidal tendencies it's uh <laughs> right it's just yeah. a fear that they accidentally hurt somebody yeah well you do have fears that's that's another part of the harm ocd you do have fears that you are going to hurt somebody too and like maliciously you know, yes and and they say what people say is the re the reason that fear is so prevalent or you know that's proof that you're not going to do it it's proof that you're scared of harming yeah. somebody and you actually you know actually detest that behavior and it's sickening to you and so you in reality would never do it but you're so scared and you cannot convince yourself because the thought comes with a normal person the thought comes you say oh that's weird and then you move on right you right. know say you say you picture yourself because you are you're you have a very vivid imagination too. And so you'll just get like an intrusive thought or picture in your head of you stabbing somebody. Right. And then most people would think that was, that was weird. And they just move on. The people with OCD think, Oh my gosh, I had that thought. That must mean I'm really subconsciously thinking about doing it and I'm going to do it. And so then they just start replaying it over and over and over <clears> again. And then, you know, the compulsion start and everything else and the checking and all that. But going back to the stove, um, <laughs> so they found that uh, it's, it's really interesting. They found that when they, when they were experimenting and observing with people with OCD sufferers and in particular, like the stove thing, that when they handed that responsibility off, to someone mm -hmm. in their household, like a mother or a husband or wife, whatever, spouse, partner, whoever, when they said, okay, you are in charge of the stove. If the house goes down in flames, it's your fault. That the OCD went away almost like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what he was saying about the trust. Like when they can, because people with OCD carry so much responsibility such a burden of responsibility like everything falls on them and so when they can hand it off to somebody else it basically disappears and i know that because i've done it with my own husband now you go check the locks like you go check the locks if it's not locked and we all get killed it's your fault so you know Just so we know it's their fault yeah. when we're all on the way to the mortuary yeah well when, when we're in heaven you. I, I heard, okay, two different, for this, I'll share this real quick, for for this guy's video that I watched, I watched an interview with him in it, it's like a little a bit of an older video, and compared to the approach here, um, this guy seemed like he could actually get down to the root causes of the anxiety and figure out how to treat them over time. What mm -hmm. I did not like about the interview that I saw with this guy, and this may be, I may be like morally unreligious for saying this out loud. Maybe I'm not supposed to say this as a Christian, but I felt like his way of dealing with it was almost like wishing it away by overlaying a religious narrative over what was happening and just reframing what's happening rather than actually dealing with the anxiety right and i, I didn't like that very much it's supposed to be yeah. from a christian perspective and because of things like that i'm i'm honestly more suspicious of like christian counselors than i am of secular ones <laughs> Yeah, so it's like they're trying to find the, an excuse to work it in, you know. Yeah, he said something in the video that was very odd. Like I, 
he didn't say anything like this in the book, but he said, um, you know, God gives people OCD for such and such reason. And I'm like, um, God yeah, that stood out to me as OCD? well. Like, I, what are I you talking that about? Was, yeah. I thought that was kind yeah, of weird. Yeah, he uh, never said anything weird. like that in the book. Okay, yeah. so the book is better than the interview? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I, yeah, there were some very religious things that it's like it's like they're um, just subjectively for no reason whatsoever leave the realm of science and go mm-hmm. into this religious narrative thing which right. not even the Bible says that necessarily, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in the book, he goes through like what OCD is. And then he goes through his own experience with OCD and the experimentation and what we've observed and stuff like that. And uh, seen in patients with OCD exposure and response prevention. And, um, you know, that's like the main form of therapy for it. Right. And so, um, which with religious OCD, it's tricky because you're like, I am not about to blaspheme, like to expose myself to this, you know, so that, that's, that's what keeps a lot of people out of therapy, um, you know, mm. who suffer with religious OCD, because the whole point is to expose yourself to your fears. And if you're like, if somebody says blasting the Holy Spirit, you're like, um, no, I'm not going to do that to get over the OCD. So, you know, it, it's, that's what keeps a lot of people out of therapy is kind of that, or at least thinking yeah. that that's what they're going to do. They might just write it down on a piece of paper and have you read it. Right, and, right. you know, it might be something like that and, or just, or just allow you to sit with the thought and, you know, not let you run away from it and do your routine, like pray 25 times in a certain order or whatever, you know, whatever your thing is. Um, but you know, most people are really scared and they think, well, this, this isn't going to work because religious OCD, it does involve the compulsions, but it's got a very scary spiritual side to it. You know, it makes me wonder when you say pray 25 times, it made me think of the kind of stuff that goes on in Catholicism when people do penance after confession, where they're told to say, say a certain prayer so many times. And then I, I think there's, it can, it can get extreme to like self-flagellation mm-hmm. and everything else. And then other works of service. And there's so many right. that you have to do. It makes me wonder if that kind of stuff was developed from a, from a person who had religious OCD. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, yeah, well, so one thing, and I was thinking about this, um, I don't know, whenever the last time I was in church was, it was, it was recent, I promise. Um, I don't think we, we missed on Sunday because my husband locked himself out of the house when he got home from work. Uh, so, check those keys again. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I even told him, I said, do you have the other set of keys? He's like, I don't need them. And I'm like, okay. And I get we'll like, find my out. Mom and, <laughs> yeah, they're going to church and then I got to turn around. And so we've, our church has been filling up and they've got to get a bigger building. So I wouldn't have had a seat. So I was like, okay, I'll just stay home. But I think it was last, um, it was the last week. And we were talking about something about the Pharisees or something. And I was thinking about like, our pastor made a point about the widow and how she threw in everything she had. And, you know, most people make that story about like, see, God's going to bless you if you give everything you have. And he said, no, I think it actually ties into what he's saying about the Pharisees, how they go into widows houses. And basically, you know, this widow felt like she had to give everything, just like preachers stand up today and say, oh, if you give me every dime you have when you walk out of here, you know, you'll get a hundredfold and stuff like that. Oh, wow. He was saying, you know, I think that might be what, what he said. I know the moral of the story. That's a good point. It's good application. But, you know, really what I think it is, is, you know, uh, it's that these Pharisees were making this woman think she had to give everything she had while they're sitting there and they can afford to give a big sum of money. And so, the woman yeah, can't. Matthew 24, 23, 14, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater damnation. Mm-hmm. And that shows up again, more or less 
in Mark twelve forty and again in Luke yeah. twenty forty seven. Yeah, so, that's where we were at was Mark twelve. Wow. That one. Yeah. So we're saying that perhaps the uh perhaps the woman who gave the last that she had was a victim of these fools. Yeah. And so I, that's what I was thinking about because the guy, Ian Osborne, in his book points out that this started when Catholicism started to get big. That yeah. that's when scrupulosity got rampant. That's when it started to pick up. When they started telling people, oh, you got to confess every sin. You got to go do this. You got to go do that. Make penance. And then, you know, whatever about purgatory and all that stuff. And, <laughs> you know, that's when that's when it started to like go crazy. And that's Martin Luther's story is he he almost died like several times because he would just go without food and water for days to, you know, fast and to yeah, try and yeah. be right with God. And then right. he was like his well, his um. I think his priest or instructor or something uh, like got so sick of him coming to the confession box. He made him go learn Greek and Hebrew. And that's when ah. he started ah. reading for himself. Like, you know, he came up with the five solas and, and I think it was what Romans five. That's, that was the really, you know, big scripture in his life that kind of led to his, revolution and setting him free and I'm, so I'm he, still, he, yeah i'm still yeah. blown away by the connection of this widow's houses because that is right there in mark 12 40 and then yeah. that uh that next one where she, where he's telling the story of the widow who cast in all she had that comes right after that right wow yeah and so that was the that was his point as he said you know i think the real point is that these guys were kind of like these charlatans out here, you know, telling you to give them all your money and all these charismatic churches. Oh, you'll be healed. Oh, you'll be this. You'll be blessed and this and that. And so, you know, it's still going on today. Yeah, and that's, so that's the kind of culture I grew up in was Pentecostal. And it was, you know, well, you don't, well, it's not our fault. You just don't have the faith to get healed. So you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. It makes me, yeah. It makes me wonder if you could, um, if you could for, so let me, let me pause for a second from what I'm about to say, because I'm about to say, I wonder, I'm wondering if OCD like that could be generated in somebody so that you could manipulate them and get money out of them. And it, you know, one of the things we saw in the video, he has this slide that says, pause the video right here and read this. He says, your OCD behaviors are simple, unconscious, childlike tricks of the mind that were installed during past times of trauma to get you through it by stopping you thinking about it at that time. However, now I'm curious about how, like what an example of that would be, but then however, they are now out of control and feel like a part of you. In fact, they're just complex, out-of-date habits and compulsions that no longer serve you at all. They can right. be overcome with the right help. It makes me wonder if if that's the case. It makes me wonder if you are a manipulative religious leader, if you could either inadvertently or overtly install OCD into somebody for the sake of causing them to be a loyal little minion to do, to you and do everything that you say out of fear of always right. not quite being or doing enough. Yeah. And I do, I do believe that that happens. I do. I mean, I think that there's a lot of components to OCD, your brain, your genetics, like my right. father evidently had it. Um, my parents divorced when I was very young and so I didn't know him all that well, but from everything I've heard about him, he seems to definitely have had struggle with OCD. Yeah, My maybe he had OCD tendencies. and it was untreated. And yeah. That, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he, he definitely, you know, got into some crazy stuff. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a lot of things that goes into OCD, your genetics, and you know your brain and even even trauma traumatic events you can get you can have a head injury and wake up with ocd oh wow. there's, yeah there's actually a guy i saw not too long ago um it's like a youtube clip where he said he was walking out of a bar one night and he got hit in the back of the head 
and then um, he they took him to the hospital. And when he woke up, all he could see was shapes and patterns everywhere. And he came this he became this like brilliant mathematician guy. And he would like see it in flowers, symmetry. He would look at the sun, and he knew all these like mathematical equations. And, and you know, he just. But also, you know, a lot of it was OCD. He became obsessed with it, and he he noticed that when he got home, he started obsessively washing his hands all the time. Mm. And so, you know, things like that. And that's that's what I was going to touch on with the, um, you know, Sarah, uh, to. Sarah Teresa, whatever her name Saint, is. Saint um, Therese or whatever, whoever that yeah, is. Yeah, Saint Therese. Yeah, so um, she actually had, gosh, what did she have? I think scarlet fever when she was very, very young. And yeah. they said she was out of it. She was talking off the wall for like six weeks. And when she woke up, she had OCD. She had, mm. that's when she started with the obsessive thoughts. Mm. And then later on in life, she died from tuberculosis. But when she was going through that, uh, you know, bout of sickness and stuff like that, um, you know, she she uh, ended up like regressing back into OCD. She'd kind of gotten it under control. And then when she went through the sickness again, it got really, really bad. And that's when she wrote all those letters to her sister. And then I think it's uh, it's a book now, an autobiography, like the story of a soul um mm -hmm. that she wrote and so yeah i mean she had gotten to a point where she had pretty much gotten the ocd under control um through something called her little way and it, it had to do with trusting in god and then she got hit with the sickness and it like all came back and mm -hmm. they said you know for the last year or so of her life she was just really really going through it like bedridden and she would just have all the thoughts and that's when she wrote all those letters to her sisters and stuff like that and she um, was a nun so yeah i'm curious so uh, how do i keep this pg rated um when you you know relationships because let me let me show you mm -hmm. you'd mentioned your parents getting divorced when you were young and so i've been i've been afflicted by what you might call cluster B personality disorders from mm -hmm. people in my life. And just, I know people probably can't see this, but if you go to the Mayo Clinic website and look up cluster personality disorders, you've got cluster A, like paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality, schizotypal personality. And then there's cluster B, antisocial, borderline, histrionic, narcissistic, and cluster C is avoidant, dependent, and then obsessive person compulsive personality disorder is over here. Now, I've I've seen unawareness of cluster B personality disorders just like completely destroy people's lives. Um sweep well, in, we nobody knows that. what's hitting them. We just saw it um well, you know, I, I I didn't watch much of it, but it was all over everywhere. The Amber Heard Johnny Amber Heard, thing, yeah, yeah. she was she was diagnosed with the cluster B stuff, like histrionic right, right. and borderline personality disorder and all that stuff. And I mean, there's crazy stuff going on with her. So, so I think that speaks for itself. Well, yeah, it seems like these things can really disrupt a relationship. So you said something about, this is curious to me in a relationship, you said something about sexual OCD. Is that, how does that manifest itself? Is that like a compulsion to avoid or a compulsion to make something what, what's going on with that if um so it's in a the fear. most g-rated way that you can say well it's a fear about you harming someone sexually um like sexually assaulting someone or a child or anything like that or being yeah. afraid of it being done to you like i i saw a girl who said that she was in she'd never had this form of ocd before and she was literally in a therapy session with her male therapist and she started getting images of him like you know doing stuff to her and she had to tell him that she was like it's so embarrassing but this is what i'm this is what's happening These are my right intrusive now. thoughts yeah. yeah right yeah and so you're like scared and and then you have compulsions and you get you get anxious and you get shy um someone in my mother's life when she was uh growing up a man um, told her not to sit in his lap because when she did, he got feelings. Mm. 
Right. And my mother told me that when I was very young. And when I was very young, anytime I sat in any man's lap, my grandfather, it, people had no issues with this stuff at all. You know, I would think, are they getting feelings? Is mm. it, should I get off their lap? And I would start to feel creepy. Like, what's wrong with me? Why am I thinking about this? So stuff? you feel like, like you're why, the why creep, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then, and then the scary thing is it turns to your like kids. You're like, oh my gosh, I must, something's wrong with me. I must be going to do this to a kid when, you know, when I'm older and because I was a kid then. And I'm like, I remember the day that it like dawned on me, like I'm an adult now. And I was like watching my sister's kids and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I was always worried as a kid about sitting on someone's lap you know, and now, now I'm the adult. Mm -hmm. And so what do I do? Just not let them sit on my lap, you know, yeah. and it, it is completely it's so irrational. Like that, that something like that has so, never happened. Yeah, I think most people have intrusive thoughts. Like one of the examples that was given was a fleeting thought of harming yourself or committing suicide. It might pass through anybody's head at a given time. Like my wife and I were discussing earlier, when it, like we like to go sightseeing sometimes and maybe we'll be uh, uh, at the top of a cliff or at a, on a tall building and you can't help but think of falling off right or some people jumping off but it's it's just a thought that passes through your head yeah and most people just like well that's crazy and you dismiss it and so you might have other similar thoughts like relational thoughts with strangers and other people that just fly through your head most people would have the thought and dismiss it but I guess with OCD people, maybe there's a less, one of the things that the doctor said in the video was that you need to understand that you are not your thoughts. And right. so I think, is is it correct that OCD people maybe have a more difficult time understanding that they are not their thoughts and maybe they think they are their thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. And so when yeah. you have some kind of creepy thought, you think mm -hmm. that that's you right? and that's your personality. And you yeah. are creepy. Yeah. Yeah, you do. And yeah, like I said, um, well, I told you before we started recording that, uh, you know, I actually saw that therapist, I think over Skype or Zoom or something, um, you know, and uh, it ended up, he was actually getting out of, you know, one-on-one -on -one therapy at the time but I had reached out to him right before and so he's like okay I told you I would so we're gonna go yeah. ahead and do this yeah. I'll I'll counsel you that's fine and um that was one of his big things is like you know the thing is you know with him is he's he's not a Christian and so he believes in the evolution and stuff like that and so he's like okay well a hundred billion years ago when we were cavemen um, we didn't really have the, the, the part of our brain that, you know, controls our thinking and stuff like that. All we had was a fight or flight response. I forget what it's called, like the amygdala or something. Yeah, the amygdala. Yeah, that's, yeah. Like, that's, yeah, that's all we that are from the water boy. Walking, yeah, that's all we are is a walking amygdala. And so you just have to understand that, um, you know, that that's what's kicking in. You know, it wasn't until like however many billion years later, he says, um, that these you started to get like rational thoughts and the other parts of your brain started to form and stuff like that. And a, and a creationist would think like right. a evolutionist would think of those as most ancient parts of your brain. And right. a creationist would think of them as most fundamental building blocks of the brain, like, yeah. like the chassis. Right. And so he's like, so you, you got to like separate the two. You got you basically his technique is you have to learn how to calm your amygdala down because you know his whole thing is your subconscious um basically has the the mind and the intellect of an eight-year-old all it does is want to protect you wow and it doesn't understand it it doesn't understand reason you can tell yourself all day long Hey, this is, this is, I'm not in a dangerous situation. I'm just sitting at home or a perfect example would be driving the car. You're, um, a lot of times when you have these episodes, you in panic attacks, especially you're, you're overworked. And so your, your, your subconscious is telling you, 
you're under so much stress, you're going to die. You're, you're going to die if you don't stop. And so it tries, it'll give you panic attacks and that fight or flight. So you go home and eventually, you know, you can't go out in, in grocery stores anymore. And then, and then you can't drive your car anymore. Just drive it around. What if you have a panic attack while you're driving? Right, oh my right. gosh, you're just going to kill somebody then. And then, you know, the intrusive thoughts and the compulsions and all that stuff. And until you're just completely homebound and, um, you know, you, you just can't get out of it. And so basically his theory and his approach to it is don't try and reason with that part of your brain you have to actually trick that part of your brain mm -hmm. into calming down like um it's it's so funny because he's he's british um and so he he told me to do this one technique and he says speak calmly to yourself like no matter how anxious you are because your your brain will eventually start responding to the calmness of your voice you wow. have to make sure you slump your shoulders. You have to get in a position where you're not tense. Yeah, you got to slump your shoulders. And he says, it doesn't matter what you say. And he started <laughs> saying banana. He's like, just say banana, 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 banana to yourself really calmly. And you basically retrain your brain to stop having those anxiety attacks. And to just like, because the thing is, is your anxiety comes up and it's going to peak. And you're going to think, oh, my gosh, I'm dying. This is it. You know, take me to the hospital. And, um, you know, most people try and run away from it. If they're afraid of grocery stores, they'll run out of the grocery store. In my case, it was really extreme because it was I was afraid of, like, going insane. And so how do you run, how do you run away from your brain? Like, you can't do right, that. Right, so yeah. I just, like, the I, I, I remember getting up to, like, run away. And then I was like, where am I going? Like, I'm right yeah. here. Where am I going? And so, you know, your your anxiety has a threshold that you reach. And then it has to come back down. And so you have got to learn to sit with it until it's gone. And so if you do that, it's so hard to train yourself to do that, though. There's another doctor who's um, Dr. Harry Berry, who deals with the panic attacks. And he basically says, you need to, he, he claims you can cure it in like a day, um, just one time. He says, if you're afraid of grocery stores, have a panic attack, what you do is you go stand in the grocery store and pretend like your feet are glued to the floor and you don't yeah. move and you just sit there and you wait for it to come up, the anxiety to peak and then it to go down. And then after that, you realize, oh, nothing happened. And then it, it just doesn't come back for some people. Some people it takes th two or three times. But, you know, for some people, it's just that one time that it happens. And that's yeah, it. facing facing that fear. So there's a difference right. between like somebody with a phobia and somebody with OCD, from right. what I understand. Um, but so the underlying anxiety, which is usually followed up by some kind of compulsive behavior and controlling thing is what the person wants to do with OCD. Um, mm -hmm. Let's... Um, I want to hear about the religious OCD thing. If we could focus on that, because that's very, very interesting to me. Yeah. Um, your your story of religious OCD, and um, I think I have a secondhand one as well. That I'm I'm curious if if that qualifies. Yeah, sure. So, like I said, I got into it a little bit, but I was, um, you know, brought up in church. I was mm -hmm. saved from a very very young age um pentecostal and they were you know arminian you know there were people going up doing the altar call every week because right. they thought they lost their salvation and yeah. so that's kind of what i grew up in is like oh if i say if if i even think of a cuss word then i'm not saved anymore Right, and, right. you know, that's that's kind of how it was taught to me. And so my mother was a first generation Christian. And she was, I guess this is the church she got involved with. And they were really like, you know, hardcore, like hair up, skirt down, no makeup. Yep, yep. You know, um, when my mom was in a really bad situation with um, 
you know, her, her first husband, um, where she was actually physically in danger Mm -hmm. and she thought she was going to leave her uh, or leave him. He started coming to church and acting like he wanted to get saved. And so they told my mom, well, if you leave him and he backslides, his, his blood is on your hands. And so my mom like stayed with him. And so she, and we were talking about this the other day, because I, I told her I was going to, you know, that's such a terrible thing to tell somebody. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's awful. You and have so to manage mom, somebody right. else's, you know, stalwartness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's like when people say, oh, if you break up with me, I'm going to, you know, commit suicide or something. It's like, yeah, it's, it's manipulative. Horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that's what she was exposed to from the time she was 13, I believe, and she got really involved. She was um, a worship leader. And, uh, you know, she always was pretty much my whole life as as a child, even somewhat into my adult life at different churches. And so she was taught those things. And so she taught us those things. She knows better now um, from me. (laughs) I'm like, you ruined my life, Ma. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much. Yeah. So, yeah, I went through a a pretty bad phase, but I'll get to that. Um, And so (laughs) she would tell me things like if I if I did something wrong, she'd be like, the Bible says, if you lie, the devil is your father and you're going to hell. You need to go repent and you need to go sit in your room and repent for, you know, three hours or whatever. And, you know, I was talking to her about that recently. And she was like, Bethany, I was so scared that you that you and your sister were going to go to hell that I right, just right. the fear was all consuming that's why I say like my mom she doesn't have full-blown OCD but she's got traces of it right. like she maybe if anything she's got like pure O um but you know she's she was just consumed by this fear that she was responsible for us and that you know if she did not tell us and everything was a bible lesson like everything with her you know, I'm talking like hours if we did one thing, like hours in scripture and scripture and scripture. My husband's like, how do you know so much scripture? I'm like my mother <laughs> every time. <laughs> and obviously I've done a lot. I know more scripture than my mom does now, but, um, you know, yeah, I've done a lot of research myself. Yeah. Yeah. I use it against <laughs> her, <laughs> but, um, so anyway, so she was, she was brought up in that and that's how I was brought up in or what I was raised believing. And so because of my genetic predisposition to having OCD, Mm -hmm. um, I started, the first thing I noticed, probably as young as I can remember, I'll say around five, six, Mm -hmm. maybe, I would say the prayers. And if like, I, I would I would have to say my, my bedtime prayers and like, you know, anytime I sinned, I had to confess a certain way. And if I messed up, if I got one word wrong, I'd have to go and say it again. So mm-hmm. sometimes, and I was just telling my husband about this too, um, today when we were talking about what we were going to talk about. And I was saying, you know, sometimes I would say it so much, I would just fall asleep. Like, because I would just go through it and go through it and go like through it. Like counting sheep or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just go through the prayers and I'd be like, it was, I had to pray for everybody in a specific order, everybody in my family. I had to use the right words. And I felt like if I didn't, God didn't hear the prayer. Like it was, it wouldn't it go through. It right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of this stuff came out of like the word of faith kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, like you, you have to have enough faith. You have to do things a certain way. When I was, um, you know, born. Uh, so the, the doctor, I was a big baby. I was 10 pounds and four ounces. So wow, they, they were, uh, four and yeah. a half ounces more than me. I thought I was a big baby. Yeah. yeah. So they were having a hard time getting me out and he took the forceps and um, he pulled me out and he broke the nerve in my eye my right eye and so I cannot turn my right eye to the right and so my mom was like best friends with this guy she didn't even tell me until I was like probably 
kin or something. I just oh, grew up no. thinking I had some genetic problem. But that's the thing. Yeah, actually, it was really, really bad. The uh, The hospital got sued so much. This happened to so many kids. There was a kid I went to school with who was a, like a, I don't know if you're allowed to say this, if this is correct or not, but I don't know how else to say it, like a gimp, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And like that was because of malpractice, too. Oh, wow. And so it that's happened. Terrible. They got sued so many times that they would not deliver babies in, in that hospital anymore. And, um, you know, the, you actually, if you live in my hometown, you have to drive like an hour and a half to the hospital when you're in labor um, to the to the closest hospital that will deliver because it's, you know, in the middle of nowhere, the town I grew up wow. in. Yeah, that's how bad it got. But my mom's like, you can still when you turn 18 if you want to. But he was really nice. And, you know, he kind of set up a payment plan for me one time. So, you know, I was just happy you were alive. It didn't bother me. Like, oh, okay, I've just gotten bullied about this, whatever, you know, that's fine. You didn't like get upset or anything. The doctor just did this. And she's like, well, he said it was your eye or your life. So, you know, I was. Just and like, and okay. who is she to know better? Right. And so, um, yeah, my, it's a lot of it started with that too. The word of faith is my mom would always say, Bethany, God's going to heal you. God's going to heal you. You just have to have enough faith. You know, it has to be the right time, whatever. And I would sit in a mirror and I would pray. And, you know, I, I would I would close my eyes and I would just pray and I'd say, God, I believe. And I would like psych myself up and everything like, oh, yeah, I'm really feeling faith filled right now. And I would just sit in front of the mirror and I'm like, can you please heal my eye? And I'd open my eyes and I would look to the right and it wasn't healed. And I'm like, oh, didn't take. Let yeah, me, you didn't let have me enough faith. Some you more. do this again. Yeah, yeah. And so I would just, I just kept doing that. And so that's that's a big part of it too. And how, uh, you know, the word of faith and Pentecostal stuff really affected everything is because it's like tied into, well, what if I don't have enough faith to be saved? What if? What if I actually don't believe in Christ? Because I get doubts sometimes. Like, mm -hmm. I remember you said one of your videos, am I the only one that ever doubts these things? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah. everybody gets doubts. Like, is he really the Christ? Do I really believe? And so I'm like, oh, I must not really believe or something. And so, you know, then I'd have to pray and then I'd be confessing and repenting because I even had that thought like, mm -hmm. oh, I doubted you. I'm so sorry, God. I'll never do it again. And, you know, you make all these promises and then you do it five seconds later. And so, yeah, it pretty much kept on like that. Um, and then, like I said, I, I had the other forms of OCD, too. My mother was the one that caught it. Um, she she didn't know about the religious stuff um at the time she didn't know what i was going through um but she saw me like turning on and off light switches a certain number of times and washing my hands my hands would be so red i would wash them in scalding water and oh, she wow. was taking yeah she read a lot of psychology books and was taking like courses and she went back to school and so she's like you have ocd you need to stop and so i'm like oh that's helpful okay <laughs> and thanks so, for telling me that yeah <laughs> yeah. And then we were talking the other day because I was telling her about that. I was like, when did you notice this stuff? And he, she's like, forever, like probably the light switch thing and the hand washing. And so, and how it's like, but you didn't know about the spiritual stuff. And she's like, well, looking back, I know because you were always asking questions like, well, what about this in the Bible? What about that? Well, how do I know I'm saved? And, you know, why aren't I healed? And, you know, it, it was just, so that she didn't know what that was. That uh, need to delineate time, everything but, out to the nth degree. Yeah. So, yeah, I have, um, so my brother and I, right. we grew up and you in the just same, need that assurance. yeah, I think we're having a delay issue here. Are you still there? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I yeah. think we're all synced up now. Yeah. Um, there was a couple of glitches. Might be that storm you're having. Maybe. <laughs> I my, my so my brother and I grew up in the same household and I did not grow up in a word of faith Pentecostal I grew up in a Baptist household and in the Baptist church 
uh, independent Baptists, we, we believed in eternal security. We believed that once you were saved, you could not lose your salvation. And salvation, you know, was appropriated by, you know, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And so we, we and, and salvation is not by works. So there wasn't any, there wasn't any kind of law keeping or circumcision or penance or confession or going to church or sacraments or anything like that, that was required for salvation. You know, just God saves those that believe. So we grew up being taught the same thing, but there's right. this one component that <clears throat> if you are truly saved, you will X, Y, you are a new creature and you will behave in this new way. Mm -hmm. Well, long story short, like my, my brother would, uh, he constantly doubted his salvation. And I think throughout his life, he was killed in a car accident in 2010, but throughout his life, I think he had at least five reconversion experiences, which is, yeah which I understand is like normal in a Pentecostal kind of yeah. framing, but at it in accordance with the beliefs that we had getting saved again. So he didn't think that he lost it and needed to get saved again. What he thought was a truly saved person wouldn't have these thoughts. They wouldn't right. do these things. And so therefore I must not truly be saved. So, you know, people like, uh, he's a guy. So he has a, he has a active hypothalamus. He has a desire to mate. So when he sees females, he has sexual thoughts. Right. It, it, I think it would be helpful for young Christian men to understand how the hypothalamus works rather than try to think of all that stuff moralistically. Like you can't follow a religion that turns off how your right. brain is designed, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so every time he would see an attractive female, he would think that he, he wouldn't have those thoughts if he was really saved. Right. And then, so he would go get yeah. saved again, or he would, uh, like if he had a drink of alcohol or if he smoked a cigarette, he's like, well, if I was really saved, I wouldn't do those things. That must mean I'm not really saved. Right. And it kind of, kind of seems like this, uh, it sounds, seems like this religious OCD to me to where he could, he had the same doctrine I had, but he could right. never get assurance it's like, it's yeah. like, I just didn't do it right. Kind of like, you know, I, I didn't wash my hands and get all, all the germs off. Right. Yeah. I, I believe in Jesus, but I, I guess I didn't pray right. Or I guess, you know, mm -hmm. and so as my wife and I were talking about this, she's like, well, doesn't he understand that there's nothing he can do to save himself? It's all in the hands of Christ. And anyway. I was like, that's not my understanding of OCD is that these logical thoughts don't really help the thing. It's not, yeah, it's not an work. injection of logic that you're lacking to stop this kind of thing. There's something else happening here. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Kind of situation. Right. And it, it, for me, it was all kinds of things like, um, you know, even just reading the passage about the blasphemy of the Holy spirit, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I just blasphemed because I read the passage. Oh my gosh, I'm not saved. And then I would, you oh, know, wow. I would, I would do that. And then of course the Pentecostals are so awful about like, well, if you don't speak in tongues, then, you know, you're not, you don't, you'll never really know if you're saved or not. Well, the whole, also, like, what about if you're critical? Like there's all kinds of things that happen that are questionable, whether or not they're legitimate yeah. or whether or not they're biblical. And so if you question, is this real or is this demonic? They, They'd uh, yeah. trick you out. Well, you're blasting right. in the Holy Spirit if you question this stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, so I mean, and even later on, uh, when I, I was about 13 and I had a, um, you know, very, I think we talked about this on the phone before, but um I don't know how people feel about this. I know it's a really touchy subject, but I had an experience. And mm -hmm. even after that, I was like, oh, yeah, now I have the proof. Now so you I'm had a, sure. like an, an ecstatic religious experience? Well, um, I would say that I received one of the gifts and could operate in it. And I still can to this day. Okay. And so, um, you know, I... Like I said, I know it's a touchy thing, but no, that's, I'm that's, not a, on this right. channel, you can say whatever it is you, 
whatever your phenomenology is, we're, yeah. we treat everything with rule omega here. Right. Well, it ties into something else I'm going to say later too. But when I was 13, that happened to me. And I was like, um, oh my gosh, yeah, now now I have assurance because they told me once I mm, got this, yeah, I'd have yeah. the assurance. And it was not there. I was mm-hmm. like, oh no. And then I'd get in my head and I'd be like, oh, what if I'm just, what if this is some other phenomenon? Like, I, I don't know what this, like, what is this? Maybe, yeah. maybe I don't really have the real thing. And so, you know, you just, you just question everything. And there was, there was um, a missionary one time, and I remember asking God all the time. I used to say, God, please just tell me if I'm saved. Just please tell me if I'm saved. Please tell me if I'm saved. And please just give me a sign, like make a rainbow appear in five seconds or something. And, and just like, you know, come down and speak to me and tell me that I'm saved and, and tell me like, it, it was just ridiculous. You give you and something so, you can hang on to. Yeah. Yeah. So I. I, um, and I do believe God in his grace would, would give me like signs of assurance, but they were, they would very quickly fade. And so, um, this missionary came to our church and, uh, I've never seen him before, but he called me up to the front and I guess he said he had like a word of knowledge for me. And he's like, God wants you to know that you're forgiven. And I was like, um, okay and i remember being on cloud nine on the on the way home and then i was like (laughs) oh my gosh but i just had this thought and now that all the forgiveness is gone oh my gosh i gotta get saved yeah it was it just it was gone it was unreal how fast it was gone as soon as i was out of that church i was i was i remember getting in the car and like god you love me so much you actually told me that and then we're on the way home and i have this thought and i'm like Oh no, now I'm not forgiven anymore. And so, you know, because we, we believed if you sinned, you lost your salvation. I thought I was like the only one if that you took sin willfully. Of, yeah. Right. I thought, I thought I was the only one that took, which is so stupid too, in light of Hebrews, you know, six, I mean, oh my gosh, like, no, you cannot keep doing altar calls if you can lose it. So, I mean, yeah, you know, it's impossible the to renew point. them again to repentance. Right. Right. If you so, can lose it, it's done. <laughs> they didn't. They didn't preach first five verse. I can tell you that they just brought that up when they wanted to scare somebody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's just. Um, I just had these things happen, you know, throughout throughout my life, where I would get assurance for this brief period of time. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it was just gone because like, as soon as you sin, then you've lost your salvation. Oh, and then the rapture thing, like, oh, if you're sinning when Christ comes back, the left behind series, if you're sinning oh, yeah. when he comes back, you're going to get left behind. And that was the other thing. And I used to, I used to think about that. It was, it was so scary too, because Mm-hmm. If I, if no one was home with me and I tried to call my mom immediately, the first thought was she's been raptured <laughs> and I've been left and behind you missed it. and I was calling everybody and my grandmother, she was, she was say, but she was, um, she was from Baltimore, a little bit rough around the edges. And, uh, she, well, she's a believer. I guess I can't be the judge of an ultimate judge of that stuff but she professed to be a believer and um you know but she she would still slip up and cuss every now and then oh yeah and so i'd be like well i can't call her because my mom says she's not saved oh my (laughs) my mom would actually have us lecture my grandma and say we called her moose we she would say we would say moose you're not saved if you cuss you have to stop cussing like you have to repent you're going to go to hell, Moose, if you die like this. It was so bad. We were lecturing uh, our grandma. Because I guess this fear just so consumed horrible. my mother, too. My mom thought her mom was going to go to hell. And, yeah. you know, I, I think back on it and I just cringe so much. She probably just rolled her eyes and was like, oh, here we go again. You know, yeah, the just the, the pains just, of having to deal with yeah. the religious, ideologically possessed family members, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
And so um, I, I, I didn't really have the greatest relationship with my mom when I was younger. Um, and then the divorce of my dad, there was a lot of stuff that went on with that. And um, then she, she just really had a string of, you know, bad um, men in her life and mm-hmm. just like, you know, uh, just would keep winding up with these awful men and you know he would just do awful things to her and um you know she biblical grounds for divorce and um she was kind of preoccupied with that and there was just fighting all the time and so you know she was under so much stress and my dad kept taking her back to court to get custody of me and my sister and she got so stressed out from that that she actually started having dizzy spells and passing out and um we had to drive over you can look this up the robert o norris bridge is like the tiniest bridge and when she was married to the guy after my dad um he lived about 45 minutes away from where my mom worked and so we had to drive over that bridge every day and uh it was so narrow like everybody in my town pretty much has a phobia of it i used to get dreams about it you know my mom did and so uh she she was like always scared she was going to pass out on this bridge and then she was driving me and my sister home because we went to school where she worked yeah and so she was under so much stress and so there was one time that was like my breaking point um when i Like I really, I would have these really awful nights where, um, you know, I would just cry myself to sleep and I was just not happy. And I didn't know what, I felt like there was a black hole inside of me and it was just really hard and it would last for, you know, months at a time. And I, I would be up for an hour, three hours, Mm -hmm. you know, and I had school and stuff. And one night I was really upset because I had actually gotten to bed and my sister had twisted her ankle that day. And she like woke me up in the middle of the night. And I always swore that my mom loved my sister better. And so my sister yeah. wakes me up in the middle of the night. She's like, Bethany, go upstairs and get mama because I need some ibuprofen for my ankle. And so I got, I used to get really mad about being woken up because it took me so long to fall asleep anyway. Right, right. So I got up and I'm like doing this heroic act for my sister. And my mom's like crabby with me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what did I do? And so I throw my blanket on the floor and I'm like crying. And she comes in and she like, you know, like screams at me. I think she had just had a fight um, with that guy. And uh, she like screams at me and tells me to get my blanket off the floor. And like at that moment, I was just so hurt by that, that I, I remember deciding In that very moment, I would never, ever go to her for anything ever again. I was going to go to God. Mm. And we had this, like, lady in the church. Oh, my gosh. She was the (laughs) pastor's wife. I mean, I've seen some crazy things. And, I mean, this woman actually had the Holy Spirit pitched to her like a baseball (laughs) <laughs> and started yeah she started running around the church and almost broke her hip on the pew she just ran right smack well, she could the pew. get up and get healed yeah. though couldn't she yeah yeah well she was like limping around after that. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just yeah she was a train wreck and so um you know she she told this story one time she's like i went to heaven and she said god told me to go tell my husband to give me one hour to pray and then I'd be done. And so she said, I told my husband and I went into the room to pray. And as soon as I started praying, God lifted me up into heaven and I saw God and I was there and he was telling me my assignments and what I needed to do. And you know, all this stuff. Does she have a notepad? Yeah, I don't even know. And so um, (laughs) he goes, she says, well, you don't want to miss those. Yeah. And she says, well, then, you know, he said, it's time for you to go back now. And she said, of course, you know, heaven's like, woo, you don't want to leave. Of course, she never gave any descriptions of heaven, nothing. And I always thought that was really weird. Like, well, that's kind of a big deal. Why wouldn't you talk about it? 
And so she's like, and when I got back, one hour exactly had gone by. And so I was like, oh, I need that to happen to me. I need God. I need you to take me up to heaven. I just want to sit on. Because so you I were saying that to dad. yourself now? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I was saying to myself, like, if God loves me, like, and, and I would try and get back in the mode of like, oh, I need to have enough faith. I need to have enough faith. Well, God's not going to take me to heaven. Look at this great woman of faith over here. <laughs> and so I'm like, I need to have this faith. And I would actually ask God. And, you know, I, I was having such a hard time with such that awful, deep hole and sorrow and crime. I would ask God, all I want to do is come sit in your lap. I just want to come sit in your lap and be loved. That's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I would just pray for that all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was, I was, it was such an obsession with me and i remember like just sobbing like hyperventilating hysterically crying because i was like i don't have enough faith i i can't i can't i'm not doing something right either i'm not saved because he's not taking me to heaven he took this other woman to heaven why can't i go to heaven mm -hmm. and it was just it was just so awful and such an awful experience and you know i would just end up like getting really angry and and bitter at god hmm. and then um i know i'm going into a lot of detail but so from that point i don't think there's anything major that went on but uh when i was 17 there was a we'll call it an unfortunate event that happened to me pretty big thing um where you know i was uh preyed upon by a much older man mm -hmm. almost 20 years older than me and so when that happened and you know i lost my virginity i was like um okay god really doesn't care about me like mm -hmm. I, i've tried to live this life like you know here i am confessing my sins all the time i'm doing everything this is just i guess i'm just not safe i guess mm -hmm. i'm just not safe and I never knew a Calvinist ever in my life. I, I still have not to this day met a someone who claims to be a Calvinist, yeah. uh, honestly. But I thought, well, there must be something wrong with me. God's just rejected me. I must have like blasphemed or something. And so at yeah. that point, I totally cut it off. And I had this, this guy who was telling me all this stuff, like saying, oh, well, I went to like Catholic school and they told us that they just threw whatever books out of the Bible they wanted, you know, when they were formulating the Bible, they just picked whatever books they wanted to form their own doctrine and threw the other ones out like Enoch and everything. And, you know, they didn't keep those. They just, so it's fake. And so I went to my mom with that question and she's like, Stephanie, whatever. She's like, <laughs> I'm those Christians. that's like, you ask her why she believes. And she says, because I just feel it. I just know in my heart that he's mm -hmm. real. And I'm like, that's not convincing anybody. And so she didn't have an answer and nobody <laughs> had an answer. So I'm like, oh my gosh, then God's not real. I've been duped. Like I've been yeah. duped into this thing. And so I went on this awful like atheist period for about the next four or five years. And, you know, just we'll say I was a bit of a prodigal son at that point, you know, right. Yeah. Yeah. Living. Um, that's also a lot where my hypochondria stems from is I almost died several times. And, um, you know, uh, that was, that was not pleasant. So, you know, like I said, when I get in situations where I feel like I'm dying, you know, it takes me back. It, I've actually been diagnosed with PTSD from that too. Yeah, so, yeah. um, yeah. And so that's, that plays into it. But anyway, so I, I went through this phase and then, um, through kind of a series of events um, where things just got so bad for me when I was 21 years old, uh, I finally cried out to God and I was like, you know, I just, I just can't do this anymore. God, if you're there, I don't even know. This is probably the first time I've prayed in years. Like if you're there, I don't know if you're there, you know, just, just help me get out of here. I can't get out of, this lifestyle I'm in and so the next day uh I actually 
you know, got really messed up and I blacked out and I hit a tree. And somehow my mom happened to be in town that day. She had sold her house and moved an hour and a half away. Yeah. And she happened to be there. And, um, you know, I was thinking I was calling um, my uncle. And I actually called my mom. And I'm all, like, drunk talking out of my head and stuff. And <laughs> I'm like, Uncle Willie, how are you? <laughs> like, I had no clue. And so she's like, where are you? I'm coming to get you. So she just happened to be there. She hadn't been there a month. And so, um, she, she, I, somehow I was able to give her directions to where I was, even though I didn't know where I was. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to give her directions and I woke up <laughs> in her house the next morning and I was like freaked out. And I'm like, what happened and why am I yeah. here? Yeah. Like, you know, and she was sleeping next to me on like the pull out couch. And, uh, I woke up and I woke her up. I'm like, what is going on? And of course she tells me all the embarrassing things I did the day before mm-hmm. when I was mm-hmm. blacked out. Wow. And so I'm like, Oh, okay. And she's like, you're going to get sober and that's what we're going to do. And so, you know, I got sober and during that time, uh, you know, I actually started to, um, go to church with her just because she wanted me to. Like, okay, just out of respect for my mom, I'm going to go. And so I, I went and I'd had a couple of boyfriends um, along the way who had, you know, claimed they believed in God, but didn't act like it. So it kind of opened me up to the idea a little bit more, but I still was like, no, this is, this is dumb. Obviously they just threw all those books out of the Bible. So it's not real. And yeah, so, yeah. yeah, that was always the argument I went back to. <laughs> and so, um, and so I ended up going back to my hometown, getting back involved in that lifestyle until finally I was just like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. And I really, that was the time where I really almost died several times. And every time I cried out to God mm-hmm. and I just believe this, like when people, I don't care who they say they are, atheists, whatever. Like when you're in a bad enough situation, you cry out to God. And so um, I did. And I was just like, get me out of here, get me out of here, get me out of here. And I noticed like people stopped talking to me. Like everybody stopped talking to me all of a sudden. Like, you know, people that, you know, I got things from and, you know, um, car rides because I had gotten a DUI, by the way, too. And so (laughs) I couldn't drive. And so I wasn't getting rides anywhere. And, you know, I just, I was like, what is going on? It must be. And then I just like realized, well, I must just need to get out of here. And I had the realization, like everybody, every addict tells herself one day, one day I'll get off of it. And I just realized, well, when is the one day going to happen? Like, I guess I'm going to have to make that happen myself. Yeah. You're going to have to schedule that bad boy. Yeah. And so I, I ended up calling my mom. And I said, look, I want you to come pick me up in like a week. And so I had a week of all this fun. I calculated out like how much of a supply I had left and in and, and my party days. And so I was like, okay, I'll be running out on this day so she can come pick me up on this day and I'm going to get wow. out of here. And I have my last little hurrah. And so she came and picked me up. Your fat Tuesday. Yeah. And so it was right <laughs> around my 22nd birthday. And, um, that was the time where, um, I don't know, just so many crazy things that happened in my life and they just weren't adding up. And I just knew God was, you know, involved in it. And so I just couldn't really fight it anymore. And so I got on my knees and I'm like, you know, the same thinking I said, okay, here's the deal. God, I'm going to give you another chance. (laughs) And I'm like, (laughs) and I'm like, second chance. Yeah, I'm like, but if we get back into that stuff I was in before of this confessing and repenting stuff, I'm out. I'm Mm -hmm. not doing this again. And so I'm like, so here it is. And then from that point on, um, you know, I just began to watch a lot of sermons and grow. And of course, I was watching a lot of people like Joel Osteen and stuff like that at the time. And then I ran across because, you know, 
um, of the YouTube, you know, the videos that will recommend based on what you watch. Right. I ran into Joseph Prince in a sermon that was called, Can You Lose Your Salvation? And I was like, oh my gosh, what a heretic. Obviously, you can lose your salvation. What a <laughs> moron. And so I wouldn't listen to it. But then it, the thought dawned on me. I said, wait a minute. That whole time that I was living this awful lifestyle, because I totally thought I was unsafe. I was yeah. like, yeah, I would have died and gone to hell. But the whole time I had this gift of the spirit. And sometimes I would test it out and I'd be like, get freaked out. Be like, I don't know what this is. It's just some weird phenomenon. I don't oh, know you what can it still is. do this. Yeah. 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 And I'm like, I don't know what it is. I wasn't taught this in church. I, you know, if you backslide, it goes away. So I don't know what this is. It's not the be. Yeah. Yeah. This, the Christians came up. This is some natural phenomenon. And Christians came up with a name for it to explain it away. And that's what I thought at the time. But when I, you know, rededicated my life, I guess, um, you know, I, I said, uh, wait a minute, I had this thing the whole time. Like, does that mean I was safe that whole time? And so I went on this fast and I was like, God, I really want some answers to this. And I read a couple articles like advocating for internal security and stuff like that. And I read a couple articles. And so I just went on this fast, I think it was for either two weeks or 21 days. And it wasn't mm -hmm. really that great of a fast. It was like, I wouldn't eat until 12 PM. Yeah, and, yeah. and and I and I was gonna fast um all social media too, except mm. for YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because I wanted to watch sermons. And so I, I fasted all the social media too. And so in the last day of that fast, I remember thinking, like, I don't have any answers. And so that sermon popped up again, Can You Lose Your Salvation? And I was like whatever I'm going to watch it and so I watched it and it was about Hebrews 6 and I watched it and like the light bulb came on and I'm like oh my gosh this is actually something worth investigating yeah like maybe I can't lose my salvation and I go talk to my sister I'm like you know really timid because this was a forbidden topic when we were kids and um I talked to my sister and I said um do you what do you think about eternal security? And she's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I totally believe in that. Like, we were brought up in such awful doctrine, Bethany. And uh, she actually rebuked me one time because I was, like, questioning her about, like, well, what about these passages in Hebrews? And she was like, I rebuke that right now. Get that out of here. Because I was, oh I was in bondage for so long because that awful doctrine. You're not going to bring that back into this house. And so um, if she was like, hardcore like oh yeah i'm eternal security now you're not gonna persuade me otherwise but me with ocd um you know i just i just couldn't accept it like every verse i would go through the bible and i would pick apart like i just i just yeah. could not i could not stop and and the hebrews was like really like that was awful but now it's one of my favorite books and, um, you know, and then there was always another scripture. There was always something else that, you know, like there's an abundance of scriptures about, you know, warnings. And so, I mean, you know, you either have to explain them away or accept them. And, uh, you know, it, it, it affects what you believe about God. And so that, that started me on the journey. And then after this, I was like, oh, my goodness. Yes, I am going to become an evangelist now. And I'm just going to go around and be like Joyce Meyer and preach to everybody. And I'm going to tell them that this is an awful doctrine that you could lose your salvation. <laughs> and so I ended up moving to where I am now. And to go to a Bible college, well, it closed down as soon as I moved here. It was oh. actually um, Andrew Womack's Bible College, mm -hmm. Paris. It was a like a um, satellite location. And so it closed down. So I was like, okay, well, I guess. I got to wait a little bit, save up some money to go to the main location in, in Colorado. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I met my husband and we got married. And um, so, and with my husband too, I actually witnessed to him and he got saved. He was an atheist so or you, maybe agnostic. You were a missionary we dating? Met. Yeah, you teased me about that before. He was my boss, thank you very much, before, <laughs> like for eight months. 
so we had we had you know some time talking and you know i think the first time we ever went anywhere he's like all right what do you want to do with your life what do you believe in and i'm like i don't know if i want to talk to him about this because then he's my boss and so you know i didn't know if like maybe he's a hardcore atheist and he'd try and get me fired or something yeah, after yeah. That. and so um you know he he just kept pushing me and then um you know, I finally told him, like, this is what I want to do, this is what I want to believe, and he's like, oh, that's so dumb, you know, evolution, blah, 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 and then I showed him your videos on your creation series, <laughs> <laughs> and we went back and forth for, like, months and months and months about this, and, you know, I was just, he would just come up with all these questions, and I would have answers, because at this point, I've been doing a lot of study, and I was into Chuck Missler, I was into, right, like, right. the math, you know, reasons for the faith, you know, all this stuff, and, um, you know, I just, he ended up getting saved, and, uh, you know, then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to see if you're actually saved first, to see <laughs> if you're, like, bearing some fruit, because I'm not going to be with anybody um, you know, until I actually know they're safe. So it was a few months later and then uh we ended up having to get married because um I had my surgery coming up and we were gonna have to cohabitate. So it's like, okay, well guess it's now or never, you know, or else <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah. So we just went to the courthouse. But um anyway, yeah, I wrestled with this over and over again and, and it like there was always always something my mind does not let it go like simple explanations are not good enough for me like mm -hmm. standing versus state mm -hmm. okay but what about this little word in here yeah, what yeah. about this and it's it's just not enough it it was just never enough it's obviously a post hoc rationalization yeah. to justify a pre-existing right. a priori ideology yeah yeah and so i i would just you know I would get to a place where I'm like, okay, I have all the verses figured out now. I'm fine. And then that was actually the worst part because I would stop reading my Bible during those times because I was mm -hmm. scared I was going to find another verse that would scare me. <laughs> and then I'd be back in this loop. Sometimes it'd last for like a year where I was yeah. just every day, like all consuming, like, you know, crying. I wouldn't pay attention to my husband. I'm just reading the scripture and oh, studying, wow. just watching watching every video can I can find and so you think that's another OCD um, oh, yeah. symptom yeah yeah like I could not go to bed like when I first started studying if I had off that day I would read and listen to sermons for 16 hours Whoa. and you know it, it was eight hours if I did have to work you know I was up like way into the night you know doing this stuff and so uh, I grew a lot in the short I'm only 27 so I was dedicated when I was 22 well 21 about to turn 22 so I mean that's like what well I'm almost 28 so about almost six years yeah, yeah. and so I grew a lot and I can well I know most more scripture than most I know that yeah, yeah. um I know more than my mom like I said <laughs> um and so I started teaching her things and she's like Bethany why do all roads lead back to eternal security for you and I'm like, because mama, you've ruined my life. That's your like, salience landscape yeah, because of yeah. what, how, what an impact it had on you. Right. And then, and then, you know, who convinced her after all the arguments I had and all the, the solid doctrine, Joel Osteen, <laughs> he said, he said one day, when you have a son or a, or a daughter and they just, you know, kind of go wayward they don't stop becoming your son or your daughter. You know, they've just like backslidden. That's how it is with us. And she's like, Bethany, I believe in eternal security. Obviously, duh. Like acting like she's believed it all along. <laughs> like, yeah, this just makes so much sense. Why are you still hung up on it? And oh, I'm wow. like, are you kidding? <laughs> like, this was so horrible. And so, um, yeah. And then finally, when, when I was pregnant, and this was after I had the surgery and the panic attacks and like I was basically homebound and one of the churches we went to like um I never I, I've always been an extrovert and so I was I never had a panic attack in public it was just always related to like the hypochondria stuff 
Yeah. And we went out with uh, the pastor and his wife and I had to run out of the restaurant. I could like feel everything rising and I couldn't talk. And so obviously mm. I did mm. not fight. I took the flight. You know, I flew out of that restaurant. Mm. And so his wife comes after me and she's like, do you have panic attacks? Because um, I have them too. And you look just like me. So wow. I was like, yeah. 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 And so that was, I, I was scared to go out after that. And so I didn't go to church. I didn't do anything. And these poor people that I was in life group with and everything, they were like always coming over praying for me and stuff. Yeah. And I was just like, I don't know, probably such a burden to those people. And so anyway, but um, I was on all this medicine and they put me on, you know, all these antidepressants for the OCD and none of them worked for me. It was awful. And it actually, you know, started making me my husband was really scared that I was getting suicidal because it's, right. because I was I was having the OCD harm images in my head and we were in a loft apartment and I would just get a flash of me like hanging myself from the loft and oh, I would tell wow. him about it and he like freaked out he actually called the cops one day and it, that was bad because they're like yeah. um because I I spilled some of my medication on something and then a drink spilled on it and so they just dissolved my pills and so he's like you took all these pills and I'm like no I didn't and so he, he's like crying calling the cops and he's like you hey, need to come get her and so they get there and I'm like totally normal and they're like can we see your bottle of pills and I'm like yeah and so they're like okay well you seem fine we're gonna go and so you know I was like I, I, yeah I'm fine I was so mad at him that was that was bad but uh yeah so that was probably my lowest point and so that was like all the that that's fine you know people just really need to be careful with what kind of medications they take because those were really bad for me they they work really well for other people i'm not saying don't take it but you know um you just have to be careful like if you if you start getting depressed and and those thoughts then just get off of it tell your doctor so um Anyway, I, I weaned myself off the medication because mm -hmm. they did not want to give me the anxiety medication without giving me the antidepressants because they're like, well, you just can't be on this addictive medicine without the antidepressants right, because right. the goal of, you know, the addictive stuff is to just, you know, like benzodiazepines is to just right. get you through a rough patch. But the goal of the antidepressants is to stabilize you long term. Right. Like you can't. Yeah, benzodiazepines. That's where. Uh, that's what got Jordan Peterson. Oh yeah. What made him so sick. Oh uh, yeah, I heard about that. It freaked me out recently, actually. Um, when I when I read that, and so, um, but I I've never had an issue with like the benzos. Like I was able right. to stop them immediately when I found out I was pregnant. Yeah, that's another thing. It it messed up my cycle. Um the antidepressants and i ended up getting pregnant while i was on birth control oh wow and so yeah um and so then i didn't find out for a while and uh you know i would had been taking all this medicine and stuff luckily i had weaned myself off of the antidepressants um before i got pregnant i did the math and um <laughs> yeah so I had weaned myself off of those, but I was still on the other things, which is actually what's harmful to the babies. Right, and right. So I had to go back and forth to all these doctors. And so I just quit taking them. I was on a high dose too, like immediately. I just, I was just like, mm -mm, no, not, not with my child. And they're like, right. no, you need to wean off. And I'm like, I tried, I tried, but I, I just said, no, I can't. And I flushed them all down the toilet. And, um, you know, I was okay after that. Thank God, you know, I really prayed about that a lot because I was really scared that something was going to happen to me because that's really dangerous to do with those. So, so uh, yeah, so your religious OCD symptoms, are they, um, at this point, are they, have they gone away based on certain beliefs or understandings or right. did you need to do something yeah. else? What, how, right. that, that's, how are that's you addressing going. that? Yeah. So when I was pregnant and I had to get off all that stuff, I decided I needed a new hobby. So I started reading and <laughs> I came across that book that I told you about. Yeah. And he gives the three examples of Martin Luther, John Bunyan, and then um, Sarah Therese. And so uh, he goes through each one of their lives. And John Bunyan really resonated with me 
and really mm-hmm. stood out to me. And basically, his theory is each one of these people, even though they lived in different centuries and they weren't really aware of each other's work, right. they um, they ended up overcoming their religious OCD by realizing that salvation was by grace through faith mm. and it wasn't by work. And that's how each one of these people came, overcame at least the religious OCD part. And so, um, like I said, John Bunyan really, really resonated with me. And um, I read Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. Mm -hmm. And that was just so transformational for me. And it was, it's such a good book to read though. Like, you know, he goes through everything. There's one time, it's it's so much like me too. you know, where there's, there's this one part where he's walking down a back alley and he's trying to, you know, see if he has enough faith. So he says, I'm going to tell, it was like rainy. So he says, I'm going to tell these puddles to dry up. And if they dry up, then that means I have enough faith. And then the thought hit him. Oh no, but I should probably pray first before I do this. And so he went like hid behind something and he prayed. And then he said, wait a minute, if I pray and then it doesn't work, then I know I'm not saved. And so he just like ran away. This is John so, Bunyan doing this? Yeah, John Bunyan. Yeah. And he documents all this. And so that uh, that was the um, illustration I was going to use that I talked about earlier. That um, he, he talked about this point where he actually started, he would, he would avoid the scary scriptures for a really long time, like Hebrews and stuff. That Those things would really scare him. In like Matthew chapter seven, you know, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, I think that was one of them. Um, I may be mistaken, but I, I think it was. And so uh, yeah. he was, oh, and, and Esau, you mm-hmm. know, the fornicator, you know, yeah. let there be any profane uh, person like Esau. Mm-hmm. And so um, uh, he he really was hung up on those, but he would avoid them. And so one day he finally faced them and he started to reason through them yeah. and he ended up realizing, wait a minute, you know, the scripture about putting him to an open shame, this doesn't mean mm-hmm. you got to do something publicly. Like you have to publicly renounce Christ. And so he started getting to the point where, um, you know, he, he would, he was thinking like, uh, this must be, this must have to be done on like a public scale or something. I haven't done anything like that. So I must be saved. And, and, you know, he just started, he just started reasoning through these scriptures and that made him feel better. And he said that he felt like he was in a period uh, where he just had like before where it was basically like storming on him, the OCD the whole time uh, or these thoughts, scrupulosity. Um, He got to a point through going through these scriptures where it was almost just like a little bit of rain droplets, just a light rain. Mm-hmm. And he described it like that. Like I just had a little bit of light rain. I would just have a doubt here and there, but mostly, you know, I was able to get over it. And then one day he said that he, he got like a, he was very visual and he got like a, like a vision, I guess, not like, I don't think like a vision from God, but maybe, I don't know, uh, like a vision where he, um, you know, he, he said that he saw Jesus advocating for him. And he said, whenever he felt like he was going to fall away or sin, he was going to throw himself at the feet of Christ. And like, he could just see Jesus interceding on his behalf and basically picturing his righteousness on Christ or, or, or his sins on Christ and Christ's righteousness on him and covering him. And then he said like that, the shackles fell off his, he felt like the imaginary shackles fell off his hands and his feet. And he never had a problem with it again. And if you study his life, he went on to become a prisoner for, I think like 11 or so years. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And he wouldn't give up preaching because the church of England was coming after him and there was stuff going on in the monarchy at that time. Um, but that was Details. that was like a really yeah that was a really big thing for me and then something i wanted to bring up um in the pilgrim's progress which you've read or you told me you read it did you read it the pilgrim's progress yeah yeah okay. i mean years yeah. ago 
Yeah, so he wrote this later on in life, and it's when he gets to the interpreter's house. And so he says, uh, then I saw in my dream that the interpreter took Christian by the hand and led him into a place where there was a fire burning against the wall. There was one standing by it who was always throwing water on it to put it out. Even so, the fire burned higher and hotter. And then the interpreter's explanation is, the fire is the work of grace that is done in the heart. The one who throws water on it to extinguish it is the devil. But you also see the reason the fire continues to burn higher and hotter. So he took him around to the back of the wall where he saw a man with a bottle of oil in his hand. He was secretly and continuously throwing this oil on the fire. And then he says, this is Christ who continually with the oil of his grace maintains the work already begun in his heart. So even though the devil does what he can, the souls of God's children continue to receive his grace. And when you saw the man standing behind the wall to maintain the fire, it was to teach you that it is hard for those who are tempted to understand how this work of grace is maintained in the soul. So my point in reading that was in grace abounding, it seemed like he had kind of come to the conclusion that it's only if you deny Christ that you lose your salvation. Mm -hmm. But later on, when he writes Pilgrim's Progress and he's in prison, I believe, it sounds like he's gotten it worked out. Like, you know, he believes like that. I guess if you are a believer, you know, God will preserve you to the end. So, um, you know, anyway, uh, that was that, of course, I read that next Pilgrim's Progress next. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was really transformational. But then I stumbled across this um, sermon. And um, basically what it talked about was, you know, Arminianists exclude all the scriptures about, you know, our security. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, Calvinists want to exclude all the scriptures about, you know, and they want to reason away all of the warning scriptures. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, why don't we take both scriptures Mm -hmm. at face value to mean what they mean and let it let, let the Bible say what it says. And, you know, just believe like you can't you can't have one thing and sacrifice the other. Both both parties are doing this. Right. And 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 he's like, you, you can't just explain this stuff away. And so, um, you know, he said and then he gave a few illustrations of this in scripture where um, basically, um, you know, it's it's possible for a believer to fall away, but God won't let that happen. Mm-hmm. And so, um, like in our flesh, it's possible for us to fall away, but God makes it clear it won't happen. Hmm. And I'm not saying this, you know, belief is for everyone, and um, you know, it's just the angle he took with it, right? It, but that was that was what clicked with me. That was what clicked because I could not I could not reason out of it. I was like, that's true. And I have a couple, you know, rules for my Bible study. If you put this in front of a five-year-old and they read it, what conclusion are they going to come to? Like Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. Are they going to think this is just some fake believer? Or are they going to think it's a real believer who's losing their salvation? Mm-hmm. And, and I know I, I'm, I'm also very dispensational too. And so I believe that has a special application to Israel and the tribulation and stuff like that. Yeah. I know that. And obviously a five-year-old's not going to know that, but, um, you know, (laughs) I I understand that there are deeper things in scripture, but like, if you've got to do so many cartwheels to get this to say something else, you're probably doing something wrong. Like, Mm -hmm. just let it say what it says. All those verbal gymnastics. Yeah. Right. But the, the Bible says, you know, Paul says it, almost every writer in scripture says it, Jesus says it himself, that he will preserve us. And I think it's just such a beautiful thing because, you know, we in our flesh could not go a day being saved without God's grace. And obviously Mm -hmm. we have imputed righteousness and, you know, Romans 8, we're already glorified. Mm -hmm. How do you get unglorified? So Mm -hmm. it's already done and settled. But, you know, I mean, I take the warnings in scripture pretty much is just, you know, like if I were to warn my daughter, um, hey, 
if you go near the edge of that cliff, you're going to fall off and die. But would I ever let her go near the edge of the cliff? No, because I'm a good mother. Mm -hmm. And and how much more is God a good father? Like he's not going to do that. And I and I know that in my own life, how he pursued me and he came after me. And there were things that happened to me that I could not explain because I was saved from such a young age. And I truly believed and I had, you know, such a heart for God. And I was praying all the time to go, will you take me to heaven and let me sit on your lap? Cause I love you so much. And I just, I just want to be comforted and I just want to be with you and be in your presence. And I was doing this like every night. I mean, his, my age at that time, they were like going out smoking weed and here I am praying to God to take me to heaven every night. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, I have firsthand experience of this. Like God did not let me get, go off the deep end. And, you know, I believe in first Corinthians, like chapter five, deliver this one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And it talks about it again in first Timothy chapter one, um, Hymenaeus and Alexander that mm -hmm. uh, Paul has to deliver them to Satan for the, uh, to be taught in order to be taught not to blaspheme. Right. And then also in first Corinthians chapter what is it? 11 that talks about the Lord's supper. And it says, this is why many of you are sick and have mm -hmm. fallen asleep. And if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judging, judged of the Lord, you know, but, but when we are, uh, I'm probably butchering the verse, but when we are, we're chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the rest of the world. And right. I truly believe that. Like if you get to a point, um, a certain point, then I, I believe that, you know, God, God is not going to let you cross that line. Mm -hmm. I really do. I really do believe that. And um, I've heard stories of it too. And so uh, anyway, that that's, that's really how I got over it because I could not reason out of it. I just could not. I was like, every time I would be tempted to go back to one of these verses, but what about this? I'd be like, okay, but what about what about the scriptures? What about Jesus's prayers? How many of Jesus's prayers do you think get answered? Jesus so, says, keep them in yeah. your name, you know? And, you know, I would just always go back and, well, how do I get unglorified then? So, so yeah, what about assurance though? What about assurance? Um, so it sounds like you have a logical schema for mm -hmm. why those who are saved would stay. So, so if <laughs> Is there any ever any time where you do something you don't think a genuine Christian would do and it causes you to doubt whether or not you're really saved at all to begin with? No, absolutely not. No, because that, I went on. Yeah, to that was my brother's tons, problem. Yeah, I went on to read tons and tons of books. Yeah, it used to be my problem. But I went on to read um, some books and learn about this. When I heard this guy preach this, I'm like, I got to learn more about this stuff. How did I not know this? And he said he learned it from an old preacher, too. Yeah, you're you're gonna hate this, but Charles Spurgeon actually quoted something exactly like that too. Um, yeah, that's fine. I can I can stomach some Spurgeon. Yeah, uh, but yeah, he he basically says the same thing. You know, like um, why are we trying to explain a way like that these people aren't saved? And and he was talking about Hebrews six. It was his expository of Hebrews six. He's like, why are we trying to say that these people aren't saved? They obviously are saved, but you know. If your friend tells you to go drink some, don't drink this because it's poison. Are you going to drink it? No, you're not going to drink it. You're going to heed the warning. <laughs> and so that's pretty much what he says. And so um, I didn't find that out until later, though. And uh, I was actually reading a Calvinist book who quoted that. And so um, anyway, um, so, yeah, I went on and I read about like, um, because that was still a scary thought in my mind, too. And then um, somebody in one of the books pointed out, like, when people look to see if they are actually saved or not, they usually zoom in on something, a particular sin that they're struggling mm -hmm. with. And they don't look at the big picture. When you step back, you look and say, is there a consistent theme of me loving Christ? Yes, mm -hmm. I've sinned. And he even goes through, like, passages of scripture where it talks about, you know, like John says, if we say we have no sin, we, we make him a liar. And, you know, he's like, nobody is advocating for us to be sinless. 
but our life should be characterized by a desire to follow Christ. And if your life is characterized by that, and even you can fall into egregious sin, like I did, horrible things I did, oh my gosh. And, uh, you know, I can't, I don't even like to think about some of the stuff. I, I'm glad I don't remember most of it. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. The gift of the blackout. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, I mean, even even during that time, it's like, I remember Joseph Prince used to always say this, a sheep can fall into the mud, but it's still a sheep. Like, you know, they can, they can get, they can get out of the mud and washed off, but you can't make a pig a sheep. Like you're either saved or you're not. And so, you know, I was like, yeah, I just fell in the mud for like five years. So <laughs> yeah. So it. it sounds like, yeah, it sounds like a logical schema. So I guess the, the thing that's occurring to me is that, um, in the video that I watched, he's saying that like logical thoughts don't combat OCD, but it sounds like what you're saying is that the logical schema that you discovered helped you. It helped me to trust Christ. Like whenever so it came out of an issue of trust right. more yes. so than the uh, logic issue. Yes. And it helped me to trust Christ. Okay. And, you know, just like Bunyan, like picture the, what they call the divine exchange. And, you know, he has my sin and I have his righteousness. And so, you know, that's, that's what it that's what the logical schema helped me get to it was a means to an end uh, i had to i had to go through all this stuff in my head and actually get to something that i could not debunk like right, no matter right. how hard i tried to get to the point where i'm like oh yeah christ did die for all my sins he is all sufficient and you know and scripture bears it out too and so, you know, I, I would like to say it's a one size fits all journey for everybody, but it's not it, right, it's right. really not. You have to go through your own things. And, you know, somebody out there might be hearing this and, um, you know, they might be like, oh, this girl's crazy. Oh, my gosh. I'm not yeah. one <laughs> for the Holy Spirit. I'm not listening I, to her. No, I you think, know, but, I think yeah. you have a lot of relatable experiences that yeah. uh, a lot of people have undergone some sim similar things right and my husband i was talking about doing this video and i was like well i just don't know like i don't know how these people are going to take it and you know what if they're like oh my gosh no doesn't she know about you know that when that which is perfect has come and you uh, know then they then it, and i'm like i can just see people i used to use those that. verses for yeah. the gifts and cessation of them and all that and uh, right. until i realized what they were really talking about it has absolutely nothing yeah. to do with that Exactly. And I, and it, that bugged me so much. And I, and people would say, you're just using your experience and you're going off of your, no, I'm not. I'm going off of scripture. Like scripture says that these gifts are here. So that he gives us these gifts. We have not come to the full stature of Christ yet. That's not going right, to happen right. until the rapture. Like, what are you talking about? I don't see anybody walking around perfect. Why do we have all these schisms? What does Paul say? <laughs> if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed of what an that's one right. another. Yeah. Like that, that's, I think that's Galatians 5. And so, I mean, you know, last time I checked, we got like 40 billion different denominations out here. I mean, it, it's horrible. <laughs> so what are we talking about? And yes, the gifts are abused. It's horrible. They're abused and they're used to make money. And it's disgusting. It's filthy lucre. It's just awful. And these damnable heresies out here. And, you know, it's, it's awful. It's awful. So you have to, you got to use discernment though. You have to use discernment. Well, you yeah, there there is an the experiential component to discernment. So you have your senses exercised to discern right. both good and evil. So there's an right. experiential, there's an informational component and an experiential component, uh, right. emotional as many other components as well. So I don't, um, I used to be of the school of thought to completely discount your own experiences and feelings. And now yeah. I understand that you you actually need to be grounded in those things mm -hmm. and calibrate those things. They're very much a part of sense making. You can't do without them. Right. And it's a, uh, it's, it's a lie to completely yeah. uh, discount them altogether. That's horrible.
that was scary for me too when I first got into the eternal security. So many people were like, "Oh, you're devil possessed if you're if you're speaking in tongues or doing these gifts or something." Right, I was like, right. "Am I devil possessed? Like, what is what is going on?" Well, that's people's and, way of and, explaining away something right. they don't understand. Exactly. Right. And then they're the like, devil well, is an hey, easy repository to yeah. pigeonhole your experience into for them. Yeah. They say, well, pagan religions do the tongue thing, but they've done studies on people that speak in tongues, like legitimate people that speak in tongues. And then these other pagan people and the pagan people, basically what they have to do is whip themselves up into a frenzy and then start chanting all this crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can just turn it on and off like whenever you want to, like for a person in tongues and what they like studied their brain too. And they found that their brain, like the part that controls language shuts down. Like I can actually read my Bible and just speak the whole time. And I, I don't miss a word that I'm reading. And so, you know, if you try and speak to somebody, I'd, I'd be interested in looking Bible, at those studies. I, I've never heard of yeah. those studies before. That'd be interesting to look into. Yeah. Well, I can send you some. Yeah. Um, yeah. Please do. Yeah. Well, so yeah, like I can read the Bible in my head and, and be speaking, you know, in tongues at the same time. Um, and you know, I, I, I'm not messing up and, you know, when you try and speak and read at the same time, like if I try and speak to my husband, like, Hey, the, the dishwasher, right. you, I so have, your, you have your brain only reading. has one language right. processor. So yes. and some people don't know, they think they can multitask and they can't, you right. can't listen to one, you can't listen to two things at the same time. You can't right. speak or write and listen to something. Right. Some people are better at switching back and forth very fast, like yeah. frequency hopping, but you can't do both the same thing. You got one right. language processor in the mind. And I can read like, you know, whole chapters without any problem, you know. And it's crazy because, you know, people always say, Well, it's it's earthly languages, it's earthly languages. And I think it's both. Um, but I did actually find out recently that I was speaking a Hebrew word. And oh, wow. um, yeah, so it was I, for some reason, we were in church one day and we were all praying and I don't do this in church because Bible says not to get up in church and go, you know, speak like this. So, um, you know, I was just like to myself, like speaking and I kept saying this word over and over again, die. And I knew the spelling of it somehow. I did not, it didn't even cross my mind that maybe it's like D-I-E I'm saying. I just knew it was spelled like D-A-I. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I just kept saying that word over and over again. And so it was years later, I was watching Fiddler on the Roof. And it was when they're singing, I think the tradition song. And then they start mm -hmm. saying, die, 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 die at the end. And so um, I was like, oh, what does this mean? And so I looked it up. What does this mean in Hebrews? And then it, was, it basically means enough. And, and historically, it meant all sufficient. And you know, when they were speaking in tongues in scripture, yeah. um, you know, in Acts, they were speaking of the glories of God. And so evidently yeah. it seems like to me, I was saying all sufficient, but, and then it clicked with me, El Shaddai, like that's uh. God's name, El Shaddai. Like, I can't believe I was saying that over and over. Like I'd never made that connection before. And so I did, I did find that out in high school, but I'm not going to sit here and say, oh yeah, I can speak whatever language I want. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, we were we were listening to something the other day. I was like, "What language is even this?" And James was like Hebrew, and I was like, "Oh, that's how much I know these languages." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I'm looking at that right now. Yeah. Um, because so people people will tell their kids in the store, like you know, Hebrew people, they'll say, "Die!" Like to stop it, like you know, because it it means enough. So if they're yeah, kids mean, behaving, this they'll say website saying it means surely or yes or something like that. Oh, really? Yeah. All, everything I've, I've seen is like, you know, people, a lot of people say it in the grocery store and stuff and they'll say it to their kids, like when their kids are doing stuff and yeah. adults are just being like, die like that. I don't know if that's like the breakdown of the language, because obviously it's not the exact same Greek um, that it was before. I mean, Hebrew. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah we've evolved. been We've been going for like over two hours now. So oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm about out of time. So what, okay. what do you want to leave us with? People have um, OCD or religious OCD. What, uh, what can or should they do to help themselves? 
Well, I would definitely say that, um, well, first, you know, check out the book that you uh, recommended. Um, okay. Well, I guess I recommended it to you and you shared yeah, it earlier. You by, I've got it on yeah. Kindle, but I haven't read it yet. Right. Can Christianity Cure OCD? I would start there. Um, that man, John Glanville, he's got a lot of good videos to break down, um, you know, like the, the root causes of it and how to deal with it from a practical perspective. If you're dealing with any kind of anxiety, you know, from OCD or anything like that, repetitive thoughts, um, check out Dr. Harry Berry. Um, he's got some good books out there on that kind of stuff. And Dr. then, Harry uh, yes. And so okay. um, he's the feet glued to the floor guy. Um, and so <laughs> <laughs> then definitely, definitely for sure, read Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. By and Paul then, Bunyan? And then, yes. And then you're just going to want to read, you know, uh, John Bunyan. Yeah. What did I say? Paul, Paul Bunyan's the I was thinking of the lumberjack. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I do that too. Um, so, yeah, I, I would definitely start there. But, you know, get a therapist that you trust too. You know, yeah, you need yeah. to be seeing a therapist. You know, sometimes you need medication to get your head above the water. I'm not an advocate for like being on medication the rest of your life or anything right. like that. Because this is 100% something you can overcome. You know, actually, I just overcame for years. I couldn't drink any coffee or else I would have to wash my hands over 100 times. Whoa. And I just actually got myself to the point where I said enough is enough. And I did exposure and response on mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. And I stopped and I drink several cups a day now, you know, I love oh, yeah. <laughs> so, like you know, right yeah, now. yeah. You need to, you need to, um, you know, find a good therapist and don't just pick someone who wants you to sit on their couch for the rest of your life. Find somebody right. that says, gonna help no, you. This is, yeah. yeah, this is absolutely, you know, and what the John Glanville talks about a lot is you can actually rewire, retrain your brain. Right. And so, um, find neuroplasticity. Somebody, yeah. Right. Find somebody who's of that same school of thought. And so, uh, you know, and then I, I mean, most importantly is just pray and, and read scriptures. And, and one big thing is if you really can't get over it, stay away from the warning passages and just read the, the security passages. Or I would say probably, you know, maybe even a couple years if it takes you that long. Whoa. Yeah. Like, I mean, you, you really need, like, if you're really struggling and this is because it'll ruin your life. Like I could, I would go mm. like days without talking to my husband because I, I'd be so engrossed in studying this out. Um, You know, I would just stay away from those scriptures that scare you. Not like the whole book, but just the passages that scare you. Don't read those. And you know, just really soak yourself in the love of Christ and, and what he's done for you and the scriptures that talk about your security in Christ. And, um, you know, I mean, if you can handle the other scriptures and read those too, you know. Yeah. So I, we're talking about something that's prescriptive right. for someone with a specific issue. We're not telling, right. we're not telling yeah. people yeah, to no, no, experience no. an out of balance right. Bible reading plan. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. no. If, if if your like life is completely thrown off and you cannot get over it, then then you should probably yeah. just avoid that. Whatever. Maybe pick one thing to focus on for now. Right. Yeah. And then you know, just uh, I mean, you just have to pray and you know ask God to to help you and to deliver you from it. And I mean, He will, and it might take a long time, but He will. All right. I mean, um, yeah, I think we got a. I think much. we got some plans of action. I think we've uncovered some uh, some issues that people might be having. This is uh, this has been very informative. I really appreciate you coming on. We've been going for uh, well over two hours now, so I, I appreciate you taking the time to like really detail this out and and share all that information. And I I imagine people will be able to relate to this, and some people will be helped by this. I I can think of people now who if if they could have heard something like this earlier they they might have had the help they needed yeah so thanks for coming on 
and I'm um, I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you again soon. Yeah, that'll and, be like three years from now again. <laughs> <laughs> and to everybody else out there, thanks for watching. May the Lord bless yeah. you and good day.